Monica somewhere. There you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Finally. I, I believe Monica played the, the original. Were you in the original production of El Paso Blue? Yeah, she was in the original production of El Paso Blue. Oh, man, I can't believe it. And Daniel, I hadn't seen you in 100 years, man. Exactly, 100 years, exactly. Desde cuando, man? I'm keeping tabs on you. I see you around. Por ahí ando. Por ahí, por acá. All right, so people are coming in. Um, let, me, let me do a brief introduction. Um, uh, so let me introduce the pride of El Chuco, uh, poet, playwright, writer, <laughs> Uh, live from Ashland, Oregon, on his goat farm. This is we would let we we are welcoming Octavio Solis, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a round. Orale, orale, man. Uh, I'm, the way this will go is that uh, I might just start with a question, and and then I'm gonna let everybody you know uh, ask their own you know questions or share anything about you know, what they want to hear from you. And, and you're, you're happy to, uh, happy to hear anything, anything you might want to say. Uh, I know you mentioned in our, you know, email communication, it's been really hard to write for the last several months, of course, with everything going on. Um, Incredibly hard. So, Incredibly. Um, so I'll just, I'm just going to ask one question and, and I'm just trying to steer this in a positive direction, but I do want other folks to, 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 to say hello and ask you as many questions as we can in the hour that we have, which is um, despite everything that's happening, uh, can you tell can you tell us like what's giving you joy? Uh, what's giving me joy is the garden, the garden and my animals. Um, I find great solace in uh, in being able to um, walk away from everything that's happening on TV and on the internet. I, I've, I've hardly left my farm for the last 14 and a half weeks since early March. Uh, my wife does all the shopping because I have a tendency to get every horrible bad cold. I catch everybody's cold. Why? Because I'm a chronic nail biter. I'm a nail biter. And putting your fingers in your mouth is the worst thing you can do for this. And it's just, I tried to quit. It's just impossible. So when I go out, I have to wear gloves. I wear a mask. Um, and so... Um, but generally, you know, I, I oh hello D. Um, <laughs> generally, I, I stay on uh, the um, I, I stay on the farm. So I've seen everything grow very quickly. I've we've got lettuce, all kinds of you know kinds of lettuce, arugula. We got leeks. We've got these amazing strawberries, little tiny but savory, really sweet, 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 sweet strawberries. Uh, we got uh, fruit coming in on our, on our apple trees and pears. The goats are amazing. The goats give me, you know, in the end, uh, what matters is that uh, there's something that depends on you to live uh, when you're on a farm and you're dealing with animals. They depend on you to live. So you have to take care of yourself so um, you're there for them. And they have no idea what's going on in the world. They just know that, you know, Sun comes up, they go out, we feed them their hay or their alfalfa and they eat and they're fine all day. They, they love us, they love our company and they have no idea what's going on in the world. They don't, they don't, they, they can't measure the tumult. Neither can the weather, you know, the, the weather when it rains and it's sunny, it's gorgeous, you know, it's, it's kind of, it kind of belies the kind of turmoil and trouble and, and, and weird feeling that we have inside uh, because of what's happening in, in the world. Uh, a lot of it unavoidable and a lot of it uh, needs to happen. Uh, but it's, um, but I take comfort there. Mm -hmm. I'm also, you know, in the, in the absence of theater and in the absence of any kind of ability to, to write, I'm doing a lot of reading. So I've been reading a lot of poetry. I've been reading um, some nonfiction um, and, uh, and some novels. Those are sometimes directly connected to what's going on out there. Like I reread Citizen by uh, Claudine Rankin, which is powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I just started Beloved, um, Toni Morrison. I read um, uh, The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de, de Zoet, um, mm -hmm. which is a fantastic book. Uh, God, I can't remember the author, but he's the one who wrote what was the title? What was the title on that? The Thousand Autumns, the of, Thousand Autumns. Autumns of Jacob de Zoet, which is by the author who wrote Cloud Atlas. 
and it's oh. a book. Uh, I read uh, a wonderful book of poetry by Octavio Quintanilla, who was the poet laureate of San Antonio. He's a young man with tremendous talent. Um, he's in, he's incredible, and uh, and his poetry really touched me at a time when I really needed to hear about you know parents and the dealing with our parents and you know, a lot of his poetry deals with personal issues as well as border issues you know identity issues um but he's so wonderful and uh and then i just started um as i said i just started uh um beloved which i've never read all right really really like well, one of the reasons we started this um well you know, this was sort of an idea is to not only maintain community, but to to document the moment that we're all in. And uh, this hour that happens twice a week now, where there's only five more sessions left until we take a break for the summer. But the part of it was to get people together and to start sharing ideas and generating thoughts about the craft and, and how we get inspired. So it's really great to hear that what's bringing you joy are, are the very simple things that 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 it, it's interesting the contradiction you bring up between like the the serenity of home life versus the chaos of the world and yeah and you know, i and i realize i'm very very lucky it's privilege basically yeah. you know, because there are a lot of my colleagues a lot of people uh that are living in a two-room apartment building in new york and feel right, right uh, here <laughs> yeah, and feel like they're, like they're uh under house arrest um and um, um so i feel incredibly lucky to be able to have a three acre spread that i can go all around um but actually most of my time is either spent sitting here at this desk uh in my office reading or whatever uh, um or it's at, inside my home in front of the tv watching you know streaming the next great show watching the black death Hmm? Watching Black Death. Watching Black Death, which is an incredible, incredible 24 lecture series. I just finished it today. Oh, wow. I just finished it. It's, it's really... like going back to school. It is. It is. And I hope I get college credit for it. <laughs> I, I kept waking, nudging Jeannie, my wife, who is, of course, ultimately the thing that really gives me joy uh, because she's here. She's here all the time. She keeps things in perspective and she has just become the most outrageously fantastic cook, um, trying new recipes all the time. And so it's just been amazing. Uh, but I nudge her sometimes and tell her, don't fall asleep. There's going to be a, a quiz afterwards. Right. Get a test. So um, so uh, before I, I, we're about to, Thea, are you, are you there? We're going to open it up to questions so people will be able to like raise their hand and we'll just call on people. Um, yeah, absolutely. So when I was a kid, my my dad, you know, I used to bite my nails too as a kid, and he would rub jalapeno on it. So if you ever want to do that to your <laughs> that just makes it even more delicious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that just makes you want to keep doing it. In fact, that's a good idea. I'd love to do that. Because <laughs> you know, I love hot stuff. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. Um, all right, Thea, let's open all right. it. Up. We have a we have whole lot of people here we have yeah absolutely um and to keep ourselves uh nice and orderly i'm gonna ask that everybody use the raise hand function if you have a question to ask um it's down at the bottom of your screen you see the participants button click on that you should get a little blue hand if you don't see it there should be a dot 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 that says more you click on that and the hand will be there and at worst you can always toss it in the chat to the right so let's start with marilo you are unmuted <laughs> Hi, uh, Octavio. I'm uh, I'm from Canada. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm currently um, doing my PhD in theater and performance studies, and I'm uh, doing a course right now that I created myself because of quarantine, uh, where I'm uh, looking at the pedagogy of uh, Maria Irene Fornes, uh, and I wanted to know if you've ever worked with her. I think you have from the research that I've done. Uh, and how her work has affected your writing. Well, I'm glad it's a good place to start because uh, Irene has been my mentor, my muse, and my uh, inspiration. Um, 
all the way through most of my writing career. Uh, I had been living in Dallas writing and I had been sort of exploring the idea of becoming a full on playwright. I had really trained to be an actor. Um, and then I wrote this play and it got done and someone submitted it without my knowing to uh, the, the Hispanic Playwrights in Residence program at INTAR. And I was accepted. So I got this call from her saying, you're in. And I was very surprised. I didn't know who she was. And I didn't, wasn't familiar with her work before. Um, so I, I, I flew to New York and I stayed with, you know, I hopped around for a while from bed to bed in New York on NYU campus, sleeping in the, some, in the dorms. Uh, that became untenable after a while. And then <laughs> finally settled in Brooklyn. Uh, but I took her workshop uh, from like right after Thanksgiving all the way to right before the 4th of July the following year. It was supposed to last a month, wow. but it, it just got longer and longer and longer because the funding was there. And because she kept also stepping out to direct the show, I think Abingdon Square was a show at the time. And uh, this was the 80s, of course. I'm aging myself. And... Um, um, and with my colleagues, we just all just kind of bonded together as we took this daily workshop Monday through Friday at nine o'clock till like one o'clock. And it was, it was incredible. And a lot of my pedagogy is modeled after the exercises that she gave. And they're, um, they're, um, I still use them. I use my own version of them. Um, and they've, they've been, uh, at the, um, They've been very useful for me in uh, in my workshop process, or even when I'm teaching one on one, and I use them also on myself. A lot harder when you're doing it on yourself. It's just so much harder. It's easier when there's a, a room full of people, and they're all kind of falling into the same zeitgeist, into mm -hmm. the same sort of spell of self hypnosis. And even I, as a teacher, start to sort of fall into it, and it's just like I'm compelled to the pen. And the pins compelled to the paper like that. Okay. Uh, it's so much harder to do it on your own, but I feel I still think it's possible because I I, I still use those techniques. It's just uh, a lot harder during this period, um, and so I, I'm undergoing a current dry spell right now. But I'll get out of it. I'll get out of it yeah. one. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. But she's been real instrumental. Uh, I use her relaxation exercises. I think relaxation is, is, is a, a, com a key component of this. And that leads into visualization. Yeah. And then from visualization immediately into the writing phase. Yeah. Uh, so those three steps are, are, are part of my pedagogy of how I approach uh, all writing. There's a book that, uh, so I'm doing this uh, course with Anne Garcia Romero uh, and and we we both were both reading the same books and there's a book uh, called playwrights teach playwriting yeah. um, and she's in here and her whole process is described like very detailed and so we were very excited to find that book so if anybody on this uh, forum wants to kind of dive into how she works. It's very, very inspiring. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. We have Alexis next. Alexis. Hello. Hello, Alexis. <laughs> so nice to speak with you. I'm a big fan, but I'm not gonna fan girl because that's unprofessional. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I started really leaning towards um, magical realism and introducing that into my work and I've really shied away from it because I really didn't know much about it and so I wanted to ask when are moments in your work where you set rules for yourself using magical realism and what does that mean when those rules break? Um, I try not to apply any rules I discover the rules as I go along in my writing um, I, uh, I create a world and then discover what the physics of that world is as, we, as I write. So I, I always uh, allow any kind of random element to come in. In fact, I think the random element is an important component of anything that is called art. 
um, you have to be prepared for it. You have to be ready to see a new rule appear. Uh, and that new rule could be that, you know, uh, only this character talks to the audience. Uh, whereas before you were thinking, what audience? I didn't know there was an audience. Um, and then you discover that. Um, there was a play I wrote called Lydia where I, I, I had intended to make that my kitchen sink drama. I was gonna write, I, I, I was doing all these non-realistic presentational kind of works and I wanted to do a play where it was just a family play and, uh, and it was gonna be like everything but the kitchen sink, you know? Uh, realism, ultra realism. And I started it and uh, I realized that um, my, the, the main character needed to speak even though she's physically unable to communicate anything that's going on in her mind or in her heart. She could not communicate with anyone in the play and yet she's the centerpiece of it. And I needed her to speak uh, because she kept wanting to speak. And so I, I just let her. And when she did that, then everything about the world changed. Um, and, and it was a delightful, but it was a surprise. And so it was, though, that's when I felt like, okay, I have something really special going on here because I'm, I, 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 have, uh, I have ceded control. I've let go of the narrative and let the narrative now be dictated by these characters who are making up their own rules as they go along. Um, at some point, I, I, uh, I realized that, um, that the rules become fixed. By the time that act two, Act one ends. The rule you generally know the rules of, of the world in which you're writing, um, but you have to be ready for surprises. Act two opened up with like a memory scene, a memory scene where everybody's acting like ants, and the set looks different. The set looks completely transformed. It's not the same as it was in the beginning, which is you know a, a living room in a house. It just completely changed, and and that shocked me. And, and I and I wondered if if maybe uh, I was writing a different, a, a, a different play, it was a separate play, but it's part, then I realized, no, it's still part of this world. So the world keeps changing and adjusting and, um, and, and creating its, um, discovering how, how, um, how gravity works in that world. And, uh, and that's a great place for a writer to be. Does that make any sense? Yes, thank you. Um, the thing about um, the thing about magical realism is is that uh, it's neither magical nor real. That's what I found. Is that is that it it the the things that seem otherworldly are actually grounded in something that makes emotional sense. Uh, and then what's real isn't, isn't real at all because it's taking place on a stage anyway. It's artifice, it's all artifice, even if it's a book. Um, and so I find that uh, that, that term is, is useful only up to a point. You it, it sort of, uh, uh, because every writer react to, reacts to it in a separate way. Um, so um, anyway. I don't know what else to add to that. I hope that makes sense. It does. Thank you very much. Next question is from Diane Vega. Uh, you are unmuted. Hello, Diane. It looks like um, I have to ask to unmute. Would you I did. Yourself? OK, I got it. I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful video accolade you gave Teatro Vision for our 35 years. That was, uh, we were honored with an award at the Theater Bay Area Awards, and you were great. That was so lit. I laughed through the whole video. <laughs> but I, really, <laughs> but I really want to thank you. And also, um, you know, we, we worked together. Um, you directed our second production of. Santos and Santos, and um, and I remember one time at rehearsal when we were rehearsing the scene where uh, Camacho's teeth were being thrown on the table, <laughs> and, and you looked at me and you went, 
oh my god that's gross who wrote that <laughs> I look at you and I go what do you mean you did <laughs> it was like well, you know, that's the thing, Diane, is that, is that uh, a, a, if, if the process is working correctly, a writer doesn't know what's going to happen next. They don't know what the next sentence is going to be, what the next line is going to be. And when they turn the page, they have no idea what's there. It's already there in a way, but, they, but, but the process of discovery should also exist for the writer. What I, what I discovered is if I can tell what's going to happen in the next page or in the next scene, um, so will the audience. The audience will also yeah. they'll get ahead. If you get ahead of the story, the audience will also get ahead of the story. And so you want to keep, as a writer, you want to keep that sense of surprise and delight, to be delighted about, oh my God, look what the character did now. That's a, <laughs> that's a great place to land. Um, because then, because then you're discovering your own writing and your own story at the same time. Um, it, 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 the, the writing exercises help that because they create the illusion that you're kind of giving the reins of control to the characters. Let them handle the narrative. They they know how to tell the story. Watch them tell the story. Um, and and you're just along for the ride, writing everything they say and do. Um, and of course, of course, it's coming out of the writer. It's not automatic writing. You're always conscious of the process of what's happening. It's just that uh, you're just giving your own characters agency, uh, which is yeah. so important to be able to uh, let the characters express themselves however they want. And it may be different they may say things that you completely disagree with that are not at heart with what you believe or you understand about the world, but it's often the things that make the, that make the character more real, that make the character more interesting and nuanced. And that's what you wanna do. You, you wanna create a nuanced character and not a, a, a slightly different version of the writer, so. Um, I, have a, I have a question on that then. Um, so then does this mean that you are surprised when this happens? I mean, are you like, whoa, wow. You know, uh, this character went this way and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, uh, of course, when I'm directing the play, uh, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I had always wanted to direct Santos and Santos, I always wanted to crack at it. And I'm grateful for to, to you and Elisa Marina Alvarado for giving me the opportunity at Teatro uh, Vision uh, for giving me that, that opportunity. Um, but it's, um, I'm wearing a different hat. I'm wearing a hat as a director. Uh, uh. And I have to think only as a director because the play's done and, I, and, and the actors need me. They don't need the writer now. They need the director to be present. Right. And so as a director, I'm coming upon these choices that the characters make or that I you know the writer kind of wrote that I feel like how do I solve this how do I solve this problem <laughs> and, and so I get an inkling into what a director uh confronts when they're dealing with my work they must also throw their hands up going who wrote this crap <laughs> <laughs> so um I'm just gonna leave with this my favorite scene in Santos and Santos was um the day of whack Oh yeah, that was amazing writing, and the visual was so amazing. So that I have to say that was a really well written, just stunning scene. I, I, I it's one of my favorite pieces of writing because it, I try to do what cinema does in a completely theatrical way, um, and uh, and I create a a montage on stage. Of, uh, of 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 a, of a moment that is that is uh, that is several moments all folded and and taking place at different times all folded into one you know ten minute moment on stage uh, leading up to uh, a cataclysmic assassination. Yeah, that was really great. Right. That's that was beautiful. Proud of that. I've had that published in a couple of volumes, uh, other books and book. Um, 
of uh, Latino literature called Echo in Texas uh, that was edited by uh, my friend, the writer Dagoberto Gill. And he asked me to submit that, that scene for it. And so it's that, that scene in, in its entirety, the day of whack is in, um, is in that book. That was wonderfully dramatic. And I'm just gonna do a shout out to Tlaloc who um, also directed one of your pieces for us La Posada Magica. That was another beautiful piece. That was our first introduction to you guys. That was awesome. Yes. Yeah, that was our first introduction. So, so anyways, you know, um, Felicidades. Uh, you're in a wonderful place. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Diane. We have one Ramirez up next. Oh, yeah, sorry. No. Yeah. Good to go. Hey. Yeah. How you doing? Um, I think this is a good segue. Actually, uh, I was gonna ask you about directing, and um, I've I have found sort of going along my career, it's like I've jumped on stage and directed, and I, I did it all because you want to be a better writer. At least that's my excuse, right? And mm -hmm. so I wondered how that was for you directing your own work. Where is it different in directing your own work when it and it's not your own work? Well, it's how I started. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't get cast in plays in Dallas, so I started writing plays that would highlight my acting talent, at, such as it is, and and I directed them myself. And I cast it cast it with my friends, my students, put it up in a in a club in Dallas, a, a new wave punk club, and we were performing there, and sort of how I cut my teeth, making my own mistakes, both as a director and as a as a writer. Um, and so when I moved to San Francisco, I started working with uh, Intersection for the Arts and Campo Santo. They asked me also uh, to like produce a work and they asked me to direct my own work. They wanted me to. And I said, sure. And so I started that way. I started that way actually going all the way back to El Teatro Campesino. I did a production of, of Prospect there that we, um, that sort of, I think told established for me that anyway that that I could be a director if I wanted to only just directing plays and not writing I felt like yeah I get it and it's because I I've been an actor before I know what actors want I know how to talk to actors I know how um, I know how to push actors um, and and I love their their real gentle souls and the and the, the risks the risk taking that they're willing to to jump into for the sake of their craft and for the sake even of, of a stranger's play uh, it's just the emotional risks they take is are, are, are incredible and so i love actors i love the, the that whole craft um and i'm jealous of them because i had wanted for a long time to be that myself um then I saw, I started directing. I did a production of Prospect there and it was really satisfying. But then I started realizing that, that what started getting in the way is that I would, uh, I, there's numerous, I should also say, there were other productions of other plays I did that were mine. I did a first production of El Paso Blue. I, direct, uh, I, I directed Ballad of Pancho and Lucy. So many shows that went through uh, Campo Santo and Thick Description as well. I directed a production of Dreamlandia, the second production of Dreamlandia uh, with people from Campo Santo in it at, uh, at Thick House with Thick Description, uh, another one of my other artistic homes in San Francisco. Um, and I directed Prospect when it went to the Magic Theater. So I, have, I had some history as a director, but I was known as primarily as a director who directed my own work. But I learned very early on um, through making this mistake, I'd, 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 um, I would direct someone in a scene and in the middle of, while, the, while, they, while I let them really give them license to act the scene as fully as they wanted to in rehearsal, at the end of it, they'd look at me like, so how do we do? And I'd say, you know, let's change this line to this line. Let's, uh, I want to cut that line and that. And, and instead of being excited, they would look extremely frustrated because it was like, holy cow, are you watching me? Are you rewriting? Right. What about my acting? When are you gonna start paying attention to my acting? 
So I decided that as a director of my own work, uh, I had to develop a, a, a procedure, a rule. And that's that assume the play is done um, when you enter rehearsal, you know it's not gonna be done, but while you're there and you're working with the actors, uh, let the actors then bring up the possibility that is there a different way I could say this line or I'm having trouble with this line, da da da. But be the director first, wear that hat first, solve the problems uh, first. In fact, what I thought that the procedure I came in with was if there's a, an issue, it's an actor problem first. The actor doesn't understand the line or the motivation behind that moment, help them. The second, if the problem persists, it's a directorial problem. I didn't guide them correctly. I have the scene staged wrong. Uh, I addressed a different issue in the scene and, uh, instead of the, 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 the one that really needs addressing. Um, and so address it as a director. And if the problem still persists, then it's the writer problem. Then go back and, and go into the room over there or go home, work on that scene, come in with a new scene. Um, because my impulse as a, initially as a director was to assume that any problem that arose, any hiccup that arose in, in the rehearsal was a writing problem. That it was like, oh God, that actor keeps stumbling over that line. I got to change it. And the actor would say, stop, 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 stop. Let me get the line. I'll get the line. Don't change it. And so that's sort of the, the procedure that I, that I used to, to work on. And I found that, that that really served me well. At some point, though, I started working a lot with other companies and you know juggling several plays at the same time. And I just couldn't um, direct my own works anymore. And so I, I, I opted out uh, in, so that I could be in, um, in the room as only the writer. And, uh, and also, I, you know, I have great relationships with so many directors that allow me to be in the co-pilot seat. Among them, my chief director is Julia Carrillo, uh, who really gets my work and who's not, doesn't have the ego to say, hey, you know, sorry, that's, you be the writer, I'll be the director, who will listen to me. And at the same time, I'll listen to her. She's a fantastic natural dramaturg. I found that also true with Richard Hamburger at uh, the Dallas Theater Center. We had enjoyed a great five, six year relationship uh, working on two shows. Um, and it's also true with KJ Sanchez, who is a, a recent discovery and is, uh, I, I've learned is a marvelous director. So there are people that I have this kind of relationship where they actually know that I have some directorial chops um, and are, are willing to listen to me and go, yes, good, good point. Great way to solve that. Um, even with uh, Bill Rausch, who directed Mother Road recently, we're having an issue with um, how to direct a character, an actor in this one moment at the arena stage and he struggled with it so hard, he didn't quite know how to tell him. And he called me from the other side and said, Octavio, come over here, come over here. He says, I'm trying to tell him how to react to the death of, uh, to talking to his father and how he should deliver the, this line to the ghost of his father that'll make his ghost finally let go and break away. And I've been telling him that maybe it was resentment or anger. And, and uh, and and I said no, it's 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 something completely different. And I said maybe it's this. And both of the actors, the actor and the director, kind of went, oh, that's it, that's it. And we did the scene, and it was amazing. It was amazing how we closed it. Uh, so some the the good directors know that I have some directorial chops. Um, Richard Hamburger said that, and I found this really useful is that my plays are already directed from inside uh, and that a good director starts to read the cues from that. And I get that directly, I learned that directly from Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare almost has zero stage directions, but it's directed already from inside, from the text. You know the distance the characters have to have from each other, you know, you can infer when they sit down or when they're leaving 
you can infer so much from that because I too have also issued stage directions because uh, I learned that you know many directors, the first thing they do is they cut all the stage directions. So I have stage directions in there that they cannot cut. They cannot cut them because they're absolutely necessary. Does that help? Big time, I, it makes sense. Thank you, I appreciate that. Good, bro. Good, good, good. good. Next up, we have Vanique. Uh, you are unmuted. Uh, hi, um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Octavio. Hi. Um, so my question is uh, definitely a lot more in your process. Uh, make this accurate if I'm getting this wrong, but I think earlier on you were speaking about how, uh, and, and it might have been before the meeting began in conversation between you, Tlaloc, and uh, um, I'm sorry, um, what's, what's her name? Thea, Thea, Thea. Um, but you were talking about, Thea, yeah. uh, you were talking about how uh, it sounds to me like what you're doing right now as a writer is consuming. You're consuming material and content. You said you're reading a lot. You're watching the next great show. Uh, but it sounds like maybe you're not putting a whole lot down on paper. I is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's exactly accurate. So um, I guess my question has a lot to do. I'm in New York City um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very, very active out on the streets. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how when something this, this, this big, when a force this big is happening, uh, whether it's right outside your door or globally, like it's happening right now, what is it that is maybe keeping you from putting something on paper right now? Um, I'm, I'm talking with other writers and it seems that things are moving so fast that it's hard to really uh, connect with a particular topic or subject matter. Um, it sounds like also, um, uh, the relevance uh, continues to change. Um, wh where are you as a writer in this? Um, yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I tried to work on, and I have like four or five commissions and I stopped, I told my agent, I'm done. No more commissions. I, I'm not writing any more plays after these four or five that I have to finish for these companies. Uh, Cause that's gonna keep me busy for the next 10 years. And, uh, and I wanna write more fiction. Uh, and, um, uh, but I have, I have my marching orders from these companies and some of them are going to, are already asking, where are you in your work? Well, in, in some, I'm, I'm barely at the research process. I'm, I, I did some, I'm writing this, I'm writing, you know, I've been doing research for this play commissioned to write a, uh, about the, uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and what made, uh, the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande, the, uh, the border. Um, and I think it's, it's opened up a huge can of worse because I've done a lot of research on that and it's, it's huge, but then this happened first, the pandemic, and then the demonstrations in, in the street that is happening actually globally, uh, for change for, and it's great positive change. I'm, I, I'm hoping that that's the direction that things finally move to and lean toward. Uh, and, um, but you know, I, I just. I just stopped and I had to just watch and I tried to write on it and I haven't been able to. Um, and I think it's because there are times when we need to just shut up and let the world write. The world is doing its writing right now. The world is doing its, I mean, we're not doing any theater in, in our theaters because there's a bigger performance going on in the world right now. That's a lot of performance art that's happening in the streets right now. And it started way before that, when those guys with their, you know, AR-15s marched uh, to the state capitals and demanded that their um, state open for business. And that's political theater. And but so is this, and it's huge. It's vast. And anything we do is going to pale in comparison to that. Um, and the changes are happening daily now, daily. Uh, we're in the midst of, I, I was talking to Lalak before this, we're in the midst of uh, two, really three, black swans in history. <laughs> the first one is Trumpism. No one could have predicted that this man would become a president. No one thought this would happen. And that they 
create this movement of Trumpism. Um, the second thing is this pandemic. Even though there are some scientists, specialists who were warning, it's coming, it's coming, be careful. At some point, you better prepare for a pandemic. Nobody really kind of prepared for it. And then it hit and it hit hard and it took everyone's work away. It just changed, upended all our lives, not just in this country, but globally as well. Um, and there've been, there's been a lot of loss of life. Um, and the coffers are, are, are getting empty in state, local, and federal governments. Uh, and then the third thing is the death of, of George Floyd. His murder uh, has what was the spark that that uh, uh, that was like the final um, straw on the camel's back that included Bri Breonna Taylor and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and uh, and Amy Cooper too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That that just sort of um, created this incredible spontaneous movement that really has no leader. It doesn't have any leader. The people are the ones who are leading it. It's a people movement. But you ask, why didn't it happen before? Where was it for Eric Gardner? Where was it for um, um, Oscar Grant? Where, you know, I, there, it happened locally, but not at this level, this, this, in, this swell, this groundswell. It's a, it's a unique black swan in history that is upending everything all the assumptions we have made about life. And I think we need to pay attention to that. I think we yeah. need to watch that yeah. and, 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 and to write on it now. I'm gonna end up writing, a, if I start writing now, I'm gonna end up writing a play that's gonna become irrelevant. Completely. In, in, a couple of, <laughs> in, a, in just days it'll be irrelevant. In a couple of hours. <laughs> but historically, you, can, I, you know, I'm looking back at the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and, and I had this idea of writing a play of somebody who has done the research and has found their original land grants from the King of Spain that said, this land in Texas, this, this ranch land belongs to me and you know, to this person, this Mexican American and goes there and says, you have to give me your land, it's mine. So it kind of deals with it uh, tangentially with what's going on now, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, but it also has, it is outside of it and separate from it. But historically, uh, it, I, I feel like it's kind of resonating. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, reading and trying to examine. I've read, I'm reading this book called The Black Swan that was written in 2007. It uses as its black swan the crash of 1987. Didn't even realize that just another year after that book was written, we'd have another huge crash in 2008. And then of course, you have this sudden halt to the economy, uh, which is unprecedented in history uh, that we're having now. And he has no, he, he just has no clue that these, these events are about to happen. Um, um, so anyway, um, I just think that right now we have to get out of the way and just watch history perform, watch um, history break away from all its previous models, all the predictable models, because we're going into a realm of uncertainty. We thought we could understand that, that the world was understandable, explainable, controllable, and it's not. None of it is. And it's a scary place to live in because we're right on the question mark. But it's also really exciting because uh, previous generations could never have conceived that this would be where we'd be now. And we are alive now to deal with it. And, uh, and one, one thing I've learned from watching these documentaries on the Black Death, and, uh, and I also have a book that is a study uh, out of UTEP that came out in 1984 on the 1918 pandemic as it hit El Paso and Tucson and uh, uh, Albuquerque and Phoenix. Those four uh, uh, board, uh, desert towns and how people reacted in 1918. 
it's remarkable how they they reacted so similarly to the way people are reacting now. And um, but anyway, I I, I just feel like uh, like all that reading that I'm doing is helping me kind of get a, a little grasp of of the world. Um, even though um, I, I think probably the reason, ultimately the reason I can't write is it's the world is so uncertain. This we're in a spell of uncertainty. And uh, and well, I'll find my way back. Uh, oh, the thing I was going to say ultimately is that all the lessons of the the things I've seen on on the Black Death and the 1918 pandemic and the crash in 2008 is that people are ultimately resilient. They're so resilient. They find a way, they, they want to move back to the normative, to what is like a, 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 a life that they can be re one day repeated over and over so they can make money and feed their families and have a job and all these things. Um, everybody wants to find that, that place again. Um, what, what's interesting is how um, this, um, the, the, the quarantine that we're doing in our own houses, we're finding our own sort of internal rhythms, making that normal. Um, I'm kind of like, you know, as soon as I heard that they're gonna lift the, 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 the restrictions in Oregon, I started going, oh, really? I mean, I don't have to stay on my farm anymore. I can go out. There was something about it because you kind of get used to it. You create, you create a pattern that is repeatable that you fall into and you make your own. Uh, and then you see a change right away and you go, oh, wow, jostling back to the normal. I'm not sure, I'm not sure we want the normal. We want something different. Uh, you know, I'll just comment on that saying that as a, as an urban dweller, especially in a place so populous like New York, um, this has been, uh, this has been a welcome stop, at least for myself and a lot of people that I speak to, you know, it's like most of the time we're on the rat race, we don't get to think, we don't get to feel, we, we're just constantly moving, uh, we are uh, responding to demands, um, now there's this who am I? You know, there's space to think about that. And going back to what you said, uh, you know, something's happened where all of a sudden this is the perfect time where, you know, everybody's protesting. I, I don't think that without COVID-19 and the quarantine and having to stop the world, at least here in New York City, that uh, people would have the wherewithal or the time and the sense to uh, metabolize these ideas and say, fuck this, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to fucking break some shit. Yeah. And for one thing, we're all home. We all have our TVs yeah. on and, and our computers on. We're all seeing this at the same time. Yeah. So uh, that's what's I think. And also there's this pent up energy of, of being constricted in one place. For so Definitely. Long. Feel, OK, we got to do this. We got to go out. And yes, they understand the risks. This is what's also really remarkable, seeing all the footage of people out on the street, they're all wearing their mask. It's just, it's just great. It's just great to sort of see that they understand the risks, but they're gonna protect themselves as much as they can, but they still have to go out and march. They yeah. still gotta make their voices heard um, because they realize that, you know, this is, the break from, this is the break from history that maybe we've been looking for and waiting for. Um, so I'm with you. I also feel like, oh, you know what? I really needed this. I was working with Emilio and uh, my other actors on Quixote Nuevo for over three productions across the country at the same time that I was doing Mother Road, uh, working at it at OSF and the arena, revising it for that at the same time that I was doing readings of my book and attending rehearsals for the uh, stage version of the book that uh, Word for Word produced in San Francisco. So when it all ended at the end of February, I was exhausted and I needed uh, time off. So some things, unfortunately, because of the quarantine uh, had to uh, be canceled or postponed, but I saw that as an opportunity to just take a, a sabbatical. It's the real sabbatical. Yeah. And uh, yeah, sometimes I'm driving myself a little crazy here, um, 
but also I'm just um, I'm just grateful for the 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 the, the portal that we all have to oh. be able to sort of see the world a little bit from the outside and and see our new place in it. Yeah. So yeah, you I, I've been going through exactly the same thing, asking who am I? Oops, sorry. That's all right. Hey, <laughs> we have about 10 minutes left and, and we have about five or six questions and I'm gonna make sure that we uh, get everyone in. Um, and, and I wanna say thank you Fanyek, for 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 all the work you're doing on the ground, man, I'm really proud of you. And uh, just stay safe, okay? Don't keep you around. All right, who do we have next? Next, we have Alex Hernandez. We're unmuted. Hey, Octavio. Um, I'm actually repping from Dallas, so oh, Cliff. <laughs> Cliff. Um, so yeah, so my question was uh, about doing uh, bilingual works and um, we've been having these conversations about how to use Spanish or Spanglish um, as a tool to like further the story rather than just like, hey, we're creating a work that's accessible to people who speak Spanish too. And so um, just guidelines or like pointers about being more intentional about using that, yeah, as a tool to like further the story or develop the characters rather than just being like, hey, I translated some things so that we can have a different um, community come and see this show. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in my place, the way I've addressed the, the Spanish in the work is I think of it as, uh, as music. I think of both English and Spanish as music. So I think of it, how it fits in musically. Sometimes the way we talk, the way we code switch has that natural musicality. We just slip it in, da da da. But what I don't do is I don't repeat the word again so that those uh, who don't know Spanish can understand it. It's like, hopefully it's in, I, I'll frame it in a way so that by the context, they'll know exactly what I mean. So I don't repeat the word. And sometimes I'll go, you know what? I think this needs, this entire uh, speech needs to be in Spanish. And if they don't get it, I think that's, important that's important that they don't understand what's being said they just know that it's something special that a special language the language of the of, of intimacy in this particular with this particular uh group of people on stage or in the in the scene is going on and and if they don't understand it they'll still in some respect get it in in your heart i saw um uh, a production of don juan tenorio at a Spanish theater in Madrid. And they were talking so fast. And I thought of myself as a Spanish speaker. I did not understand their Spanish at all, particularly because it's in the Castilian Spanish, which is really uh, difficult for me to, 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 to get sometimes. So I'm always like two or three sentences behind. But boy, I just was swept up uh, with these passionate speeches, this love. Um, almost like sonnets that came out of those characters. And they all they did was stand still and look at the other character and it was like opera. They just, they just delivered it. It was powerful and moving. And it's like, I don't care what they're saying. It's like, I'm in an, I'm being transported by this language, just surf it, just surf it. And, um, and so I want to create that same experience for those who don't know Spanish, because I found that there are many uh, people in of my community uh, who are Latino who don't know Spanish now. You just move one generation, two generations away, and they don't know it. Um, and yet, I feel like I'm I'm writing the plays for them as well. It's got to be for them, um, because I can see also that in like 50 years, maybe even less, we'll be the dominant minority and in fact maybe in the majority demographic in this country so i'm kind of writing for posterity as much as i'm writing for now so the spanish has to be it has to be intentional You're, just as you said um of course you know it depends on on each circumstance each circumstance is going to call for what it needs um because some characters may have a limited access to the spanish others it may be the only thing they speak. And so when somebody 
in that in like in that family, like Claudio, for instance, in my play Lydia, he was not a, an English speaker at all. He just knew Spanish, and so when uh, so he only expressed himself in Spanish, and it was how other people behaved that we understood what he was saying. But there was a moment where Lydia says, no, in English, I want you to tell me in English, tell me what happened to him in his tongue, in your son, what your son speaks, what your daughter speaks. And Claudio then was forced to kind of, in his broken way, use this, this English that he then, because he didn't have access, access to it, he made it lyrical. He made it, the English matter even more. Um, so, and what he couldn't, he found, he used a Spanish word and then that, that Spanish word would land with a, you know, like a, like a grenade into the scene. Um, so that's, I, I think of it more in terms of not only the psychology of the character, but also in terms of the music of the, uh, of, of the scene of the play. Uh, and don't try to think, I don't try to think of it in terms of, um, making sure that that everyone gets everything some people are just not going to get it and there may be some spanish speakers in the audience that are just not going to get the the play uh, a lot of the play because i do write for a largely english speaking audience if uh if i were if i were living in mexico i would only write in spanish and not use any english at all but here um because I can see who my audiences are, and especially as I move into the regional theaters, into the large resident theaters, and I see the audience, I go, hmm, so now how do I deal with this? I have to, I, I just made my peace with it, and I'm writing, I, I said, I'm writing for an English-speaking audience, but I'm going to make them work. I'm going to make them work at the Spanish that they get by keeping it, by keeping it true to that. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. All right, our next one is from Natalia Delgado. You are unmuted. Hello, thank you so much for, um, for speaking truthfully. I really appreciate it. Um, so I wrote down my question because I sometimes forget. <laughs> I lose my, my track because there's so many good um, questions that are being thrown out there. So I need to stay organized in my brain. Um, so what is one piece of advice that helped you move forward as a writer um, during your early career? Because I'm experiencing um, this shift of creativity and how I how I create and how I consume. And so I I also have been reading a bunch, watching a bunch of documentaries, and um, I, I I kind of feel like my brain is a little full at the moment with the uh, information. And I think I'm just trying to um, figure out or transition into from prim primarily being an actor slash teacher to writing more and um, potentially seeing more like of a producing aspect or I don't know, just I guess in encouraging more voices to to speak up and for me to listen. So how, what was what's a piece of advice that you have for for an early career writer like me. <laughs> um, don't be excellent. Don't, don't even be great. Don't even be good. Just write it, write it down. We put too much pressure on ourselves to be like right out of the gate, to write the perfect opening line for the play, to be as good and as, and as excellent. And, and then we read the work and we just even the first page, we read it and we go, oh, this is terrible. And we ball it up and throw it away. And we start again and again and again and again. And that's because we set high bars for ourselves. We wanted to be good right off the gate, right, right from the get-go. And just let go of those standards. Quit being so damn excellent and just tell the truth. Just write as messy and as ugly. Trust it. Trust. Have faith that your first draft is going to be horrible. It's going to be ugly. But in there are gonna be the kernels and the structure of a great work. And then the editing process is all about applying excellency. It's all about looking at that line and go, okay, 
this line is a complete trite line. I've heard it, I think, in another play. So how do I re rewrite this to make this mine? Then you apply the craft of that. Then you can take the time with that. Um, but to be writing and then crossing out constantly what you're writing and going out, it's, 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 it's wrong because you don't know what you're crossing out. That may be the absolute perfect line. You just don't know it yet because you don't know the story. Mm. Wait until you have a body of work and then go do the editing. Then look through it, sift through it and go, well, this scene is actually a scene from another play. I'm gonna take that out and move it over here. And this line, well, it's not a bad line, but I think I need a better word. So you can go to, you know, thesaurus.com, get your rojets, thesaurus, look it up, find a better word. Maybe it's a word in a different language, like Spanish. Um, that's when you do that. But right now, you want to get caught up in the onrush of language. You want to you want to explore the mystery of being. You want to get caught. You know, I think, uh, I think uh, that the characters that we write about are already all inside of us. There are ghosts and you have to be ready to listen to them. That's what the process of writing is to me. It's what Toni Morrison ca uh, called uh, the chaos of the needy dead. Mm -hmm. And um, you just gotta be, you just have, your, have to have your ear cocked and trained for the needy dead and to listen to them and then write what they say. And it may sound like it makes no sense. It may sound ugly. It may sound like, it, like, like it's bad writing, but do it anyway, because it's closer to the truth than actually writing the well-made play. Uh, I've read a lot of well-made plays and they're dead on the page, you know? But it, the, the, the writing that is alive is always messy. Uh, painters, when they start painting, they, they're always just slapping, they start by slapping plain paint on there. They don't even know what they're doing. It just, nobody can tell what they're doing. Uh, but out of that, they find what the painting is, what the real um, work is. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, I, I feel like, because I, I asked those questions in like, like in a variety of different ways to different playwrights. I, I've, I've asked Susan Laurie Parks and she said the same thing. She's like, just write, like, you know, just trust your, trust your gut and, uh, and trust your heart. Cause a lot of truth comes from the heart, but our mind tricks us and wants us to, to conform to the societal we're, expectations. We're also the repositories of memory, of genetic memory, the, me the memory of our ancestors. We are the, 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 the repository of all that. And it's memory that is desperate to stay alive. That is what is resonating when you're sitting down in front of your computer or your, or your writing pad. And so you want to keep that memory going by writing it down. That's what I mean about ghosts, that they're, these, these ghosts are, are the, the real stories aren't out there. They're not out there, you know, that you can find in the paper or the torn from the headlines thing. The real stories that matter that are going to be the stories that you will want to work on for you know years are the stories that are already in here. Right. Thank you. I, I, Thank the you. way I describe it is there's like little scrolls rolled up and slipped into the flutes of our bones. Flutes mm. mm. of our bones. Okay. Um, we're, we're, we're past the hour, but Octavio, do you have time for maybe course, one more? I, I'd love to take more questions, of course. Right. I, yeah. I, 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 Yay. Just tidy. <laughs> <laughs> Got time for one more. Cynthia, you're oh. unmuted. Uh, hi, thank you for taking my question and thank you for being here and talking to us. Uh, I'm, I'm here in El Paso. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh. I'm here in El Paso. I, I was uh, doing my MFA in, um, in in UCLA when the pandemic hit, and I so I came back home, yeah. and um, and so uh, my question uh, goes back because we brought up uh, Lydia before in in these talks, and uh, they recently performed it in um, at UCLA, and uh, I I didn't get to go see it, but some of my friends. Did. And one of the things, uh, well, I was really excited to get their, um, 
their two cents on it because I really love the play and it's really exciting to have you here and have Juliet here as well. Um, but my, but one of the things one of my playwriting friends uh, told me was that he he was interested with uh, how how theater itself it's evolving and how um, and uh, and I, I feel how society is evolving and how I feel for the better. It, if it be possible, if uh, maybe in the future, if the character of Ceci could be played. Um, by two actors being that she does have a disability and there's a lot of actors with disabilities trying to find work. So I, I, it was an interesting thought that uh, I, might, I wanted to get your, your opinion on. I don't see why that couldn't be a possibility. Uh, I, I think it could work. I think it could work very well. Um, I think it could be really kind of beautiful. Absolutely. As long as the other possibility, I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be a binary choice. It can, you can have it both ways. Um, that's the, the magic of this. Um, uh, yeah, we had, when we did uh, Lydia at the Denver Center in its uh, world premiere, we had an audience of uh, disabled um, um, people come uh, to see the show and they responded beautifully to it. They were very, very moved. And uh, it was like the, the play was giving voice, the character of Sissy was giving voice to a lot of their uh, uh, um, most basic needs and, and feelings. Um, and I, but I was a little nervous, I was a little embarrassed because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, they, they're, I, I didn't mean to represent them all and, uh, but with an actor, but, uh, but I felt like when they saw it and they responded, so responded in this really positive way that I felt a little vindicated by that. Um, so it, it seems like that would be the natural progression. That should be the natural progression that it moves to. I'm writing another play uh, where um, uh, I, I came across just mentally across the same thing. It's, it's a, uh, a play I'm writing for um, um, Cal Arts and for Duende, Duende Arts, uh, the program inside Cal Arts, And it calls for a character who is in some scenes, um, he's, he's the patriarch of the family, but he is a motherfucker. He beats his wife. He has everybody in the neighborhood afraid of him. He's got his homies and he beats his wife, beats his kids and, and uh, everyone lives in fear of him. And then he has a stroke. And for the rest of the play, he is stricken with a stroke. Uh, he, he, is, he can barely talk. He, he is paralyzed on one side of his body and he still wants to rule over the house uh, and have the, uh, have the power of his own family that he's always enjoyed, uh, but he doesn't anymore. And everybody knows it and they want to respect him, but they all, especially his wife knows that she is now the one in power. She takes his ottoman and his sofa chair. It's her throne. She is now in control. And um, and 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 where he's and he's called on to act as the father, as a, as a patriarch of this family. He's called on to do something uh, to to avenge his own son's death, but he's completely powerless now with his stroke. Whereas she now has all the power and it's on her to try to be the one to, um, to do something about this, uh, this murder that happened. So, uh, but in that case, I feel like, you know, I feel a little bad about this because this would be a great part for somebody who is disabled, but there's no way, I think, I think especially because he's because they're shifting so much from one to the other, I just don't know that that it can be done in that in, in that split way, uh, without having another actor um, on stage, uh, which you know, with which raises its own sort of other questions. So, but I appreciate you bringing that up. That's really good, and I don't see that Ceci couldn't be done that way. Uh, did you see it in El Paso? 
I did. I did. Um, Beautiful job, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did amazing. Uh, and mm. they're off. They're all having. They're off, off, and doing their own thing, and I'm really happy for them. Oh, good. I wanted to show you this. Oh. Uh, Have you seen these? Yes. Loteria cards. <laughs> uh, loteria with uh, Loteria El Paso. And it has the uh, lagartos over here. Oh, my God. Nick, now, if you get that in the mask. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a Game of Thrones mask. <laughs> uh, I think Juliet left us, but she said um, oh, one no. idea, have the actress playing Lydia also play the speaking Ceci, mm -hmm. double cast. Mm. Oh, wow. That Juliet. Well, there, there's a scene where, uh, where at the end of the play where Ceci does speak, Ceci, uh, Lydia is, becomes an, an, inter, an interpreter of Ceci and Yes. Tell the story until Ceci jumps up and then finishes the narrative. So, but I think it still worked. I think it yeah. still worked. Sure. Uh, Thea, where are we at? I believe we are at time. Yay! That is really? it for today. I'm, I'm willing to entertain more questions. <laughs> All right. So, Fabio's email is. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You know uh, they can do that. They can have that. Okay, so Octavia's on, on the Facebook, I think. Are you on Facebook still? Yeah, I, I um, like like someone said before, um, I also have, uh, I don't quite have the emotional bandwidth now to uh, cope with a lot, to, to just have all these things in my consciousness right now, um, especially when it's um, so chaotic. Uh, so I have pulled away from uh, internet quite a bit since I, I even said no to some other Zoom events because I just felt like... Uh, right, right. But you know what? I, I really appreciate you spending your time with us. And, um, um, you know, I hope that we're going to take, we're going to do a few more of these and then we're going to take a summer break. But, you know, we'd love to have you come back maybe, you know, uh, at some point or maybe you can invite someone you love that you want to talk to. Well, um, thank you again for your time. And uh, thank you all, all of you for, for joining this session. Can we all give a round of applause or say goodbye? Unmute yourselves and just go, hey, Octavio. Octavio, Octavio. Oh, thank you. Whatever new normal happens, um, uh, we can't wait to see what you what you bring us. You you have I have been inspired by your gifts, so thank you for for, for sharing that with all of us throughout the years. You've been an inspiration to me, of course, and to everyone who's here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a usted. Thank you. All right. Paso. Javier, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Chico. Chico grande. Chico. Nueva York. Nueva York. Nueva York. We'll see you all on Friday. See you Friday. Thanks, yeah. I don't know Thanks, who's coming. Thanks, Octavio. Bye, Octavio. Adios. Bye. Adios. Bye. 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 Octavio, talk to you later, Lok Dog. Bye. 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 Bye.